In the quiet streets of Riverside County, California, a sinister presence lurked in the shadows, a man whose twisted desires led him down a path of unimaginable violence. As the 1980s unfolded, Riverside County was a community seemingly at peace, yet beneath the surface, a predator walked among them, hiding in plain sight. It wasn't long before the first signs of terror emerged. A series of brutal murders rocked the community, leaving investigators perplexed and residents in fear. Each victim met a horrifying fate, their lives cut short by the killer's unfathomable cruelty. The hunt for the Riverside Killer had begun. As the body count rose, investigators meticulously pieced together the puzzle. A pattern emerged, a signature in the killer's methods linking the crimes together. The killer primarily targeted women, particularly those who were vulnerable or marginalized. His victims often had a history of involvement in sex work or were struggling with addiction. By preying on women in these circumstances, he may have believed that he could carry out his crimes with less risk of detection. This unfortunate reality highlights the vulnerability of certain populations and the importance of providing support and resources to those who may be at greater risk of falling victim to violent crimes. At this time, 15th body was found and was identified as Carol Lynn Miller. Her totally nude body was discovered by workers in an orchard on February 8th at Mount Vernon Avenue and Pigeon Pass Road in Highgrove. Cause of death was multiple stab wounds to the chest and asphyxia. Her body was arranged in specific positions or poses, which added a gruesome and theatrical element to the crime scene. She was mutilated after she was killed. She had ligature marks on her body. This method of killing was consistent across multiple cases and contributed to the establishment of a distinct modus operandi. No personal item were found with her body and she was dumped in the remote location. All of these evidence suggested that her killer is none other than the Riverside Killer, who killed 14 other women like her. However, there was one inconsistency in Carol's crime scene. There was a half-eaten grapefruit just beside her body. Maybe the killer has eaten a bite and thrown it near her. This shows that the killer felt disdain for his victims even after their murder. At this time, all the people in Riverside County were aware that there was a serial killer on the loose. There was a lot of pressure on the police department from the public and media, which is why a task force was created just to capture the Riverside killer. Just a few weeks later, the body of Kelly Hammond was found by a trucker near the intersection of Samson Avenue and Delilah Street, south of Highway 91. Authorities found Kelly's corpse still warm. At this time, his kills were starting to be more frequent. There were some other consistencies which included tire tracks, shoe prints, and fragments of red sleeping bag with cat hair. This shows that the killer had a pet cat. These were the evidence that was taken into consideration as DNA technologies were not that advanced and uncommon. As the killer always hunts at night, it's possible that he may be single or married to someone who works at night. He also inserted a rare 90-watt light bulb fully intact inside the vaginal cavity of one of her victims. The level of precision was disturbing as the attending pathologist said that the killer could only make this possible with the use of a great deal of care. His actions went beyond the act of murder itself and demonstrated a disturbing level of cruelty and perversion. Detectives knew that their suspect may appear to be a very normal, stable guy with a family and steady job. He may possess a charismatic and manipulative demeanor. They can be skilled at gaining the trust and confidence of others, making it easier to approach potential victims. Police received a call from St. Croix County Sheriff's Department in Hudson, Wisconsin. They had a suspect named Alex in an unrelated crime who said that he had met a guy at a party where that guy confessed that he killed Carol Miller and threw a half-eaten grapefruit to her dead body. This information startled the detectives as information about Carol's crime scene was not released to the public. When they met Alex, he told them about the guy in return for his plea bargain. Police went to arrest the guy that Alex told. He surprisingly turned out to be the husband of Carol Miller. The police didn't know anything about their marriage because their marriage was a secret. They didn't tell any friends or family members. About the crime scene information, he called the Riverside Police Department asking for his wife which he had seen in the news, they put him to the Riverside coroner's office, which sent him a letter with all the details. He was investigated and eliminated as a suspect. This case was gaining bizarre fame and controlling the flow of information was becoming difficult. Alex, on the other hand, knew about the letters and was just taking advantage of this situation by getting a plea bargain, but he was given nothing. 
By this time, 17 body of Catherine McDonald's was found near a barren construction site in the Tuscany Hills section of Lake Elsinore. She was the only black woman that he had murdered and the most mutilated. The detective noticed that the tire tracks were changing at the crime scene, but the size was always the same. It was determined that the killer had a van and was changing its tires to confuse investigators. Although the killer changed the tires, still the size of all tires were 88 inches, which is very narrow tire. When searched, that which van could fit in with these tires. Shockingly, there was only one van that could fit in with these tires. It was a third generation of Mitsubishi Delica. It was a major breakthrough as police now knew what killer might be driving. Patrol cars and undercover cops were dispatched to stop and investigate every Mitsubishi Delica they find. However, they found one, and it was stopped by a patrolling officer. The man in the van identified himself as William Lester Suff. The officer asked him to step outside and open the back door of the van. As soon as he opened the back door, the officer saw the red sleeping bag and roped. He immediately arrested him and took him to the police department. The detective and officers were shocked to know that this was the killer, who was always under their noses. William Suff worked for County Supply. It was the same place where police officers and detectives would go to get desks, chairs, and file cabinets, and Bill Suff was always there, helping them load these equipments. One day, two investigators were added to the task force investigating the murders. They asked Bill if they could use his telephone. He agreed. Then they used his telephone and his desk to write information about murders that he had committed in front of him while he was just two feet away. He was married and had a wife who was just 18 years old, almost 20 years younger than him, who didn't have any idea about his murders because she works at night. Shoes were found that matched the shoe prints at the crime scene, and multiple sets of tires were found in his garage that he changed to confuse investigators. Bill Suff was born on August 20th, 1950 in Torrance, California. He had a troubled upbringing, claiming that he was physically and emotionally abused by his mother. As a child, he exhibited disturbing behaviors such as cruelty towards animals, which is often considered a warning sign of potential violent tendencies. This, coupled with a lack of empathy for his victims, led him to seek dominance over vulnerable women, primarily those involved in sex work or with a history of drug use. The act of murder itself granted him a perverse sense of power and control over his victims, fulfilling a dark and twisted fantasy that ultimately culminated in a series of brutal killings. Suff's criminal record began in the early 1970s and included offenses such as assault, driving under the influence, and theft. In 1974, he was convicted of burglary and served time in prison. Suff held various jobs, including working as a warehouseman and a part-time dispatcher. William Lester Suff's trial took place in the mid-1990s, during which he faced charges for the murders of multiple women. The prosecution presented a wealth of evidence linking him to the crimes, including forensic evidence, witness testimonies, and his distinctive modus operandi, such as changing the tires of his van at crime scenes. After deliberation, the jury found Bill Suff guilty of 12 counts of first-degree murder, reflecting the gravity and premeditated nature of his crimes. Given the severity of his offenses, Bill Suff received a death sentence. This meant that he was slated for execution for his role in the murders. He spent over two decades on death row in California's San Quentin State Prison. During this time, he awaited his execution, which is the legal process for carrying out a death sentence. Before the execution could be carried out, Bill Suff died of an apparent suicide on June 28, 2020, while still on death row. Bill Suff's trial and subsequent conviction stand as a testament to the diligence and determination of law enforcement officials who worked tirelessly to bring a dangerous serial killer to justice. His death on death row marked the end of a dark chapter in criminal history, offering some closure to the families of his victims. Support us for more videos.